Good evening. We're beginning now a special class on Teshuvah. Based on the teachings of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, in the Sefer Atanya, um, we're calling this class the Long Short Road to Teshuva, which is based on the uh, Balatanya himself, Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the first uh, Rebbe of Chabad and of Lubavitch. So when he wrote a special essay entitled Igeres at Teshuva, the Letter of Teshuva, he entitled it um, Kolel Kol, um, I'm sorry, Igeres at Teshuva, Miadunenu Marenu Nishmaso Eden, Bederech Arucha Uketsara. It's the long, short road to Teshuva. Kolel Kolen Yan Teshuva, which will explain all the aspects of Teshuva. And for someone, to write a kuntras, a little booklet, which includes within it all aspects of teshuva, is very difficult because you could write volumes and volumes on the mitzvah of teshuva and not begin to cover all the aspects of teshuva. However, what he is saying is that um, we're going to go through what the Alter Rebbe explains, his perspective on the mitzvah of teshuva, and we'll see that within it, it will include all other ideas behind Teshuvah. In other words, this is the basis for Teshuvah. This is the real meaning of Teshuvah. And from there, we can extra extrapolate all the other ideas. So let me begin with an introduction. The, the Kabbalists believe, they understood, that the secret to the performance of the mitzvahs is to understand the mitzvah better, not just in the realm of pshat, which would be the halachas for how to perform the mitzvah, and not just the remez and the drush, which is the symbolism behind the mitzvah, but they felt that you can do a better job of performing the mitzvah if you know, so to speak, the wiring that's happening behind the machine, excuse the metaphor, of when you push this button, how it actually works and what it does in the upper realms. And by understanding how that works, you facilitate and you allow the mitzvah to be performed better. So for example, uh, this isn't teshuva, but coming up in a number of weeks, we were going to perform the mitzvah of tekiah shofar. So you listen and you hear a hundred sounds. Is there a difference between this sound and that sound? Is there a difference? You just have to make sure they're a certain length and that they have a certain um, intensity. And for yourself, you have to be inspired and motivated by the reasons behind the mitzvah of shofar. But why all these sounds and what are they actually doing? So if you haven't seen yet, but in the holy books, they explain that each particular sound does a different thing in the upper worlds. That's really complicated, all the kavanas of Tekiah Shofar. And it would be nice if the person who's blowing Shofar in your shul is familiar with these kavanas, these intentions, so that they can facilitate this. But for us, with each of the mitzvahs, we are supposed to learn not only the simple explanation of the mitzvah, but the secret behind what's happening with the mitzvah. And so too, the Alter Rebbe wants that when we perform the mitzvah of Teshuvah, it shouldn't just be a, an apology and then we reconnect to Hashem. There's something much, much deeper and more real that's happening in terms of what actually occurs to your soul while you perform the mitzvah of Teshuvah. And hopefully over the next five weeks, we'll have opportunity to go through this country, this letter, the Egeris HaTeshuva. Hopefully we'll get through it and have at least some understanding of both the obligation of Teshuva and the definition of Teshuva and what's really happening when we do Teshuva. So the, it's going to get complicated. It's going to get really complicated. But hopefully the first class will not be so complicated. So just to begin with a short introduction into why the Alter Rebbe refers to it as Derech Arucha Uketzara. This is based on the Gemara in Erevin, Dafnun Gimel Amad Beis, that tells us that Yeshua ben Hananiah was the great debater of the Jewish people. He 
always was the one who represented the Jewish people in all the debates, and he never lost a debate. And he said, he said, I have never lost a debate, no person has ever defeated me, except for three occasions. There was a woman, there was a young girl, and there was a young boy. And we're going to skip the example of the woman and the young girl. You can look that up yourself, Erevin 53, because that's not relevant to us. But the third example, which is the young boy, the story goes as follows. Rabbi Shua ben Hanania was walking down the road, and far off there was this city he was trying to reach. And he came to a fork in the road. And there was a young boy who was sitting in the fork in the road. And he says to him, by which way shall I go to this town? So the young boy points to one of the um, paths and says, this is the short, long way. Then he points to another path and says, that's the long, short way. So he says to himself, short, long way, long, short way, short, Long sounds better, because short is first. And so he walks for about 15 minutes, and he sees the city clearly approaching, and as he reaches the city, he comes to a dead end, gardens and fields and a big giant wall. So he walks back to the fork in the road, and sees the child still sitting there, and says to him, you told me this was the short way. He said, I also told you it was the long way. Meaning, the short, long way is the path that all of us are always trying to take. It's the path where we try to keep it short, but when you do try to do things short and you don't do it properly, it ends up being the long way. You know why it's the long way? Because you have to walk all the way back and actually take the right road. But when you take the long, short road, that's the one where you do it slow and steady, and it might be the longer road, but it will get you there. And the Gemara tells us um, that Yeshua Machanani, when this boy said to him, but it's, you know, I, I told you it's the short, long way. I kissed him on his head, and I said to him, Ashrechem Yisrael, how lucky are the Jewish people. Shikulchem Chachamim Gedolim Atem, you are all truly wise. Migedolchem at Ketanchem, from the oldest to the youngest, meaning that even this young Jewish child understood that every opportunity was an opportunity for a lesson. And although we don't have his name, this lesson that he would teach Rabbi Shomer Hananiah, which Rabbi Shomer Hananiah would then impart to us, remains with us forever. The Alter Rebbe is saying like this, you can try to do teshuva, take the short way, basically you walk in Rosh Hashanah and just um, you know, say to Hashem, um, I, I'm doing teshuva, I'm returning to you, and then on Yom Kippur, you recite all the piyutim, and you say all five prayers, and you clap al chet, and you fast, and you do whatever you need to do, and then it's over. But where have you really gotten to? How different are you now than you were last year, Elo? Do you feel like you had this short road, and you came up against the brick wall, and now you've, you've gone back, and you find yourself once again in the fork in the road. And so he says, stop trying to take the short road over and over and over again. Let me explain to you the long, short way. And in this case, it's the complex, but truly meaningful way. The safer that the Alter Rebbe wrote is called Sefer Atanya. That's what everyone calls it. They say, uh, uh, learning Tanya. Except Tanya was not the name of the Sefer as it was officially given. If you look in the, uh, on the inside of every uh, cover of the Sefer, it's actually called Likute Amarim. Likute Amarim means a collection of teachings or sayings, a collection of statements. If anything, there's another name given to it, which is Sefer Shal Benunim, the book of the Benunim, of the people who are not Sadiqim and not Rishayim, as defined in the book for anyone who's read it. Why do we call it the Sefer Atanya? So there's an ancient tradition 
amongst the Hasidim. The Zohar has many different sections, some of which are very, uh, I call it pshat, almost like midrash. But some sections of the Zohar are really, really complex. You can read it a thousand times and have no clue what it's talking about. One of those sections is called the Idra Rabbah. The Idra Rabbah is really, really complicated. And the Idra Rabbah begins with the word Tanya. Tanya is a word which appears in the Gemara, which means that there's been a Tanaic statement. The Idra Rabbah, this most complex section of the Zohar, begins with the word Tanya. So the Hasidim said, because the word Tanya is related to the word in the Torah, which says, V'lama saniun es lev Yisrael. Why do you uh, deter? Why do you try to um, convince the Jewish people um, not to try. So that word, Taniun, represents there's a force in the world that tells you it's too hard. I can't do it. It's too complex. There's a force in the world like that, like there's a force for anger and there's a force for hatred. There's a force for, ah, don't bother, it's too difficult. The word Tanya which the Idra Rabbah begins with, is meant to say, no, you can. It goes against the Saniun as Lev B'nai Israel. Specifically, when it comes to looking into deeper levels of the Torah, many people go, listen, uh, for me, just understanding the simple level is enough. Which is good. Most of the time you have to learn the simple level. You have to do the simple before you get to the complex. But if there's an idea which is a little more complicated, it just means you have to focus a little more and think a little harder. So we're not supposed to give in to that. I, I, I just want my, I want my Torah prepackaged and in an espresso shot. The, you have to work for it. And that's represented by the word Tanya. And that's why the Alter Rebbe begins the Sefer Atanya with the word Tanya, even though he starts off quoting a Gemara, and that Gemara doesn't have the word Tanya. It's as if he put that word on purpose there, because he, was, he meant to say that this word should counteract this force trying to convince people to not bother. So it's interesting that when it comes to the Igeris at Teshuva, the Alter Rebbe again begins with the word Tanya. And here is how the Sefer begins. He quotes to us, and we're going directly into the definition of Teshuva here. The Gemara in Yoma, Daf Pevav Ahmed Aleph, 86a, teaches us a famous teaching, which is codified by the Rambam, and everyone needs to know this, because this is very, very important. Just before you begin the process of Teshuva, we just um, entered Chodesh Elul, you have to know this most basic Gemara. Sha'al Reb Masya ben Kharash as Reb Lazar ben Azariah Beromi. Reb Masya ben Kharash asked Reb Lazar ben Azariah in Romi, Shamata, did you ever hear Arba Chaluke Kapara, Shahaya Reb Yishmael Dorish, about the four levels or divisions of atonement that Reb Yishmael used to teach? In other words, I heard once that there's four different levels and divisions that Rabbi Shmuel had. Do you know what it was? Can you teach it to me? Amar, he said, no, 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 it's not four. Shloshahim, there's only three. Uteshuva im kal echad ve'echad, but each one requires teshuva. So when you heard four, you were mistaken. The three different levels of um, kapara, of atonement, but each one of these three needs the fourth one, which is teshuva. And here the Gemara begins. Avar al asay. If one transgressed a positive commandment, v'shav, as soon as you do teshuva, enozaz misham atshemochlen lo, immediately you are forgiven. Shanamar, as it says, shuvu banim, shovavim, return my wayward children. Which means, as Rashi explains, that there are things for which teshuva alone can help. 
So what should Teshuvah alone help for? I'm going to use an unfair term right now. For the lowest level, which is transgressing a positive commandment. If someone failed to fulfill a positive commandment, so let's take an example. If let's say someone didn't um, put to fill in on one day, or somebody didn't bench after they ate and they were fully satisfied, or someone didn't hear show for any other positive commandment. So if you do teshuva, and we haven't defined teshuva, of course, that's going to come soon. If you do teshuva, you are immediately forgiven. Next level. Avar alosa say, if you transgressed a negative commandment, so we're considering that the next level of sin. Now, we can't even begin. But also teshuva. So the first thing you have to do is teshuva, because as we'll see, every level needs teshuva. But teshuva tola, the teshuva is only going to suspend and cause your punishment to be delayed. So if you do teshuva, let's say somebody ate a non-kosher food, let's say uh, someone ate uh, you know, uh, bacon, or someone wore woolen linen, these are negative prohibitions. So when you do teshuva, the teshuva holds your sin up, it suspends it. For Yom HaKippurim Mechaper, and then Yom Kippur removes the sin. How do we know this? Shenemar, because it says, Ki bayom alechem, Upon this day, God will forgive you from all your sins. And this is very important because this answers a very difficult question, and Rashi phrases it this way. If you would start from Bereshus Bar Elakim at the beginning of Tanakh, and go all the way till the end of Tanakh, at the end of Divrei Ayamim. Do you know how many different times you will find that the Navi or the Torah tells you to do Teshuva? And each time it's described differently. We just had two verses. One verse says, Shuvu Banim Shavavim, do Teshuva, and that's it. And the other one says that Yom Kippur atones. What do I need Yom Kippur for? If Teshuva atones, why do I have a Day of Atonement? You have to do teshuva. So Rabbi Shmal is answering this question. He's saying that it depends on the level of the sin. If you've transgressed by failing to perform a positive commandment, for that teshuva is enough. But if you've transgressed by actually transgressing a negative commandment, teshuva is not enough. Teshuva will hold it up and Yom Kippur will atone. Now, we need both. If you don't do teshuva, Yom Kippur doesn't help, according to this opinion. And if you just do teshuva, eventually the sin will come back to haunt you and it will remain there and you'll be punished. But if you do teshuva for any negative um, things which you've done and Yom Kippur goes by, so then you're atoned for. And I want to stress this because this is so important. We all, everyone, ain't tzadik ba'aretz, ain't anam tzadik ba'aretz, ashi asetov lo yechta. No one is free of sin. No one is free of maybe even some more serious sins. But at least for the first two, and that's for transgressing a positive commandment or a negative commandment, teshuva, and, a, and for a negative commandment, Yom Kippur will erase. Carrying on in the Gemara. Avar al krisus and misus based in, if someone transgressed for one of the things which you're liable for either death penalty by the hands of heaven or death penalty by the hands of Bastin, that's more serious. Here, this is kind of scary, but here it's not enough to Shuva and Yom Kippur. It's not gonna it's not gonna be enough. Yom Kippur will do something, which is also Teshuva if you do Teshuva, Teshuva Yamakipurim Tolan. So just Teshuva will do nothing. Teshuva and Yom Kippur will give you some time. The Yesurin Memarkin, but the person has to suffer to be cleansed. And we're going to talk about this suffering. What's the point of suffering? 
but the person has to be suffered to be cleansed. Shenamar, because we have a verse in Tehillim, Upakadati b'shevet pisham u'benegayim avonam, and I will account with the rod their transgressions and with afflictions their sins. That means there are things, specifically things for which you're supposed to get the death penalty, which if you do teshuva and Yom Kippur goes by, that will give you some time, but eventually you need to have suffering. And uh, the verse suggests that you have to suffer, and we're assuming that the suffering is for the more serious sin. And I know I've mentioned this in years past, but the halacha is that even if you have atoned for a certain sin on one Yom Kippur, you're, supposed to, you're still supposed to go back, even the next Yom Kippur, and do it again, and do a better teshuva. And this is certainly true of anyone who wasn't necessarily raised um, um, religious or who took a break from um, being religious. Um, at that point, they likely transgressed uh, multiple times things which are liable for either a death penalty by the hands of heaven, a death penalty by the hands of uh, by the hands of the courts. Um, um, what? what are they? So I'll give I'll just give some examples and and uh, perhaps at some point maybe we can uh, discuss some of these things more. I'm just making the point that you know this isn't uh, for anyone to feel bad about it. Obviously, if someone turns their life around, and they come back. A bal teshuva is even greater than a tzadi gomor, but nevertheless, you still have to do teshuva on those things. So, for example, if someone did something as simple, uh, simple, but it's a simple act of buying meat that's not kosher, so that hasn't had the blood removed and hasn't had the fats, the prohibited chelav removed. So those are two prohibitions, which, I mean, doesn't, you didn't kill anyone, you didn't uh, um, hurt anyone, but within the process of life, the person has transgressed things. Those are two examples of things for which you get the, um, the death penalty by the hands of heaven. If someone... Um, didn't know about Yom Kippur when they were younger, and they ate on Yom Kippur, that's something which technically is a transgression of something which you... Now, obviously, they didn't know, so they wouldn't get the death penalty. But the point is, it's the level of sin for which is the equivalent of the death penalty by the hands of heaven. Or some things which are death penalty by the hands of the courts, um, by the hands of Basin, such as if someone didn't keep Shabbos properly. Right? So uh, you know, a full list perhaps is necessary, but, but there are things which a person has to think about. And these are the kinds of things for which we say that um, teshuva is the first step, and that's followed by um, Yom Kippur. And then the person has to suffer in order to... And we're going to talk about this suffering because the Alter Rebbe breaks down how to, how to, how to understand that. Rabbi, so it's actually... Why, is it, are you saying that it's quite evident from the text that uh, somebody who was at, like, at the level of Tzedok uh, Shinishba would st actually kind of have... Uh, they also have to do the Teshuva... I, I don't see why not. I, I don't think that anyone could say, I mean, it's certainly without question, someone who has no idea, doesn't know anything, would be even less than Shogig. There might even be Ones, which is compelled to do so, but nevertheless... But still, yeah. but are they, that's, that's an interesting concept, actually, because if you can think of them having, a teshuva, having to do the Teshuvah. It's like an opportunity. Right. But is it, are, so are they, would they, I'm just curious, would they actually be, uh, their halachic level, would they, would they be... Uh, liable for death penalty, or no, no. We said all these examples. You're not getting the death penalty because you didn't transgress with witnesses and warnings. You didn't even know about it. That's but, not the point. But, but you have transgressed something which is the kind of sin which is liable for the death penalty. So, which is this is what it's talking about. Yeah. So this means that it's somebody even like Tidak Shanishba or uh... that's what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. Gemar continues, Someone who has done the worst of all sins, which is the desecration of God's name, someone who does something publicly and everyone talks about um, you know, how religious Jews, etc., etc., or as Rashi defines it, someone who doesn't just sin themselves but causes other people to sin, 
Ein koach lo b'tshuva litlos. Tshuva will not suspend. Lo mi yom kippur im lachaper. Yom kippur will not cleanse away. Lo not will not wipe away. Lo be yisur in lamarik. And even suffering doesn't have the ability to save the person. Elo kulam tolem. All three of them are going to suspend. Umisim emarekes and only death will truly cleanse this person. Shnamar, because we have a pasig in Yeshaya, Venigla Ba'azne Hashem Tzvakas, it will be revealed in the ears of God of hosts in Yechuper Avanazel Echem Atemusen, if this sin shall be forgiven for you until you die. So, which means that there are certain sins for which you need death to atone for, and the Gemara is explaining, or Rabbi Shmal is explaining, and that refers to Chil Hashem. But did they not mention the sins which are written in the Sidurim for Teshuvah, Tefillah? Yeah, we're, we're talking about teshuva. We're talking about, about teshuva. You know, when the Rambam breaks down Hilchas teshuva, the Rambam adds that besides for teshuva, we need to feel on tzedakah. But we're just trying to understand the mitzvah of teshuva itself. Rabbi, uh, but so does it mean uh, that death, uh, you, just, you know, everybody dies, or is it death from, uh, you know, outside forces? No, no, death atones. Death atones. Everyone dying. So we, death, what does it really mean? I mean, somebody commits, uh, you know, a kill of Hashem. And, uh, so, you're right. So if he does teshuva and Yom Kippur goes by and he suffers, then when he dies, he'll be totally forgiven. Yeah, but then everybody dies. So what's yeah, but you have to die in a state of teshuva. Yeah, if you do teshuva and you have Yom Kippur and you suffer, then the death will be the full atonement. But still, it doesn't, uh, as long as the person seems to be, do, have done, has done all three, it seems like there is no difference between, because uh, as long as the person lives, all the, all the problem that ex, ex, they might have, all they feel is the suffering, the worst, right? Uh, everybody dies, and once they die, everybody is clean. No, only if they have teshuva yeah. and Yom Kippur right. and suffering. Right, but that's but that's also so 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 is I, the person before. So is the person. No, before. the other person before dies before they die. As soon as they suffer, they're forgiven. Yeah, but how do they how do they care one way or another? You're asking a question as to what difference does it make whether they're forgiven in their lifetime or not. Yeah, that, but precisely. Uh, that 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 might be answered later. Okay. Question for you. The basis of the Pesukim that, 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 that these guys are, are formulating these, these divisions, what did the generations do before Tehillim was written or Yeshaya? I mean, what were they basing it on? Well, before Yeshaya or whatever, they, they would have not known um, what the different forms of atonement are. So what we're saying is this is what Rabbi Shmuel is doing. Rabbi Shmuel is saying, I have a problem. I see this verse, which says teshuva is enough. I see this verse that says Yom Kippur will atone. This one says that suffering, and this one says death. He's reconciling them. Right. So he's saying there are different levels of sins. Right. right. Basing it on, on to hell. But, right. right. That's what he's no, doing. I, I get it. I just... It's, it's loosely constructed if you have to base it. Yeah, on. in fact, the, the way Rashi seems to read the Gemara, Rashi has the exact problem that you have, yeah. which is that Rashi is saying it seems arbitrary. You know that there's four levels, and we know this, the, the level of difficulty. Teshuvah is automatic. Yom Kippur is easier than suffering, and suffering is easier than death. So then it makes sense that you would line them up. But you don't see anything in the verse that actually suggests right. that it's referring to that. Yeah, Rashi seems to have that problem. In fact, the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, asks a very difficult question. He says, when the halacha is, we know, that if you're faced with a positive commandment that clashes with a negative commandment, which one wins? Positive. The positive commandment. The famous rule called Asei, Doche Losase. A positive commandment will beat a negative commandment. Which means, which is more stringent? The positive commandment. So he asks, a great question, then why is it that when it comes to this hierarchy, the lowest level of transgression is the positive commandment? And here is where the Alter Rebbe begins to open up to us um, some of what we need to know about Teshuvah. So he says, when you transgress I'm sorry, let's go start the other way. 
when you perform a positive commandment, the performance of a positive commandment it has a greater effect than the lack of transgression of a negative commandment. Mm. When you do a mitzvah, such as shofar, or teshuva, or sukkah, or learning Torah, or sending the mother bird away, when you do those things, he says you bring down a light all the way from the highest place, and that illuminates your soul and connects you to the light of Hashem through the mitzvahs. Something which is not true in the case where you don't transgress a negative commandment. It's like the juxtaposition of returning a lost object to someone who's, who is just overjoyed to get it back and not stealing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's a great comparison. It's a great comparison. However, the other way he says, once you've already transgressed, so the failure to perform a positive commandment is a failure to connect to that light. And the truth is that you can never, even when you do teshuva, you can never bring back the light which you would have had had you said that Shema that one time, had you done, um, you know, um, done this act of kindness, had you, um, you know, kept Shabbos in the proper way. Because that moment is gone. Because you cannot bring back that moment. However, it's all, you're still neutral. You don't have that light. And, and certainly without question, you've rebelled um, against Hashem. So you've rebelled against Hashem because Hashem told you to do something and you didn't do it. So teshuva, there's nothing that you've actually done. It's just the rebellion. So rebellion can be fixed through teshuva where you ask Hashem for forgiveness and you promise not to do it again and then you reconnect to Hashem. But when you actually transgress a negative commandment, you bring down, you bring a blemish into your soul, and that blemish reaches down into the depths of your soul to the equivalent of what the mitzvah would have brought light to your soul. And therefore, teshuva is not enough, because teshuva simply apologizes for the rebellion. But what you need is kapara. And this is very important because the Alter Rebbe stresses this. You know what the word kapara means? To wash away. To wash. To wipe away. Meaning you're not just um, you're apologizing. You're actually cleaning up the mess. So therefore, he says, yes, the performance of a positive commandment is a higher level than the performance of a negative commandment, meaning not transgressing it. But when it comes to the sin, the failure to perform a positive commandment causes you to have a rebellion against God. You didn't listen, so which you can do teshuva for. But the transgression of a negative commandment actually creates this blemish which reaches down into the deepest depths of your soul, and that you need more than just an apology. You have to actually clean the mess. So he says, Ki bayom hazeh an Yom Kippur, yechaper alecha. Yom Kippur washes it away. Yechaper alechem, letaher eschem, mikol chatosechem, to purify you from all your sins, lifnei Hashem titharu, before Hashem you'll be purified. Before Hashem, meaning even reaching this level of your soul, which is connected to Hashem, you can even get in there and wash away. I know we're quite a few weeks before Yom Kippur, but um, we'll come back to Yom Kippur, mention Yom Kippur later. But what we're talking here is that the passing through the day itself is like, excuse the terrible analogy, like walking through the car wash where you're not doing anything, but by passing through it, 
the machine works on cleaning you even though you're just sitting there doing nothing, that's what Yom Kippur you should see it like. Passing through the holiness of the day if you've done Teshuvah. Otherwise, it's like going through the drive, uh, the, the uh, car wash with your windows open. Not recommended. Mm-hmm. Right? But if you've done Teshuvah, and so you've prepared yourself for Yom Kippur, then you walk through Yom Kippur. By the end of Yom Kippur, you are clean. Is the pas- the pastor is using two different uh, terminology. Le chaper, le right. Is it two different stages? Uh, you know, he, he, he's not getting into that. He's not. That's a good point. The tahir can also mean to clean, and why he changes the words—that's a good question. He's not dealing with that, but he's saying it means to wash away. So with the assay, you don't have any spills. You just didn't know what you're supposed to do. Here, you actually have a spill with a negative commandment, and so you've got to clean it up. But by krisus misus based in. When you transgress something which you're liable for the death penalty, these serious things, there, it's not just a surface stain. That's where the stain, if I could use the analogy again, has made it into the paint of the car. Now we're talking about some scraping happening. Now we're talking about removing of parts and rebuilding. That's why Yisurin, you need Yisurin, you need suffering to be Mamarek. Mamarek is related to the word for um, really getting in deep and cleaning, a deep clean. And then when a person suffers, and he's going to talk about this later, suffering makes your soul shiny. Mm. There's really no better way of saying it. It's like Libun. Right. Now, we're going to talk about this because, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Now, he, he's going to say that there's ways to do this without, while avoiding suffering. He's going to break that down soon. We'll get to that in just a bit. But at least that's what the Gemara means. So we're going to come back to some of these points. But the Balatanya um, says... So now what we've got for ourselves is teshuva across the board. You always have to do teshuva. You should do teshuva right away. Uh, we t- it's, a, it's already the month of Elul. The Sephardim are already early in, in, in the morning. They're in shul. Ashkenazim are a little later. We'll get there. Bezus Hashem. But it's already time for teshuva. Elul is the month to do teshuva. Don't wait. Begin teshuva now. But what is actual teshuva? So he says, the Balatani says, there are many people who think, many simple people who think, that teshuva means fasting. Teshuva means suffering. Teshuva means self-affliction. He says, that's not the definition of teshuva. That is something you might have to do for level three. But all of them require teshuva. So what is teshuva itself? So I'll read to you his exact words. Because, quite frankly, this might be the simplest version of teshuva in words. I'm not saying in actual performance. Mitzvah sa teshuva mina Torah, according to the Torah level, he azivas hachet bilvad, is just abandoning the sin. This is a very serious leniency, because there are other opinions who are going to add many more parts to it. But according to the Balatanya, uh, the mitzvah of teshuva, according on the, to the Torah level, is simply to abandon and stop doing bad things. The Hainu. She yigmor belibo, to decide in your heart, believe shalim, with a complete heart. Leval yashuv od lekisla, that you will no longer go back to this foolishness. Limrod b'malchusa yizvarach, to rebel against Hashem, or transgress either positive or negative commandments. This is very serious leniency. And I'm not calling it a leniency uh, because it's, an, it's easy. I'm saying it's a leniency because what he's saying is like this. Let's take an example. If, let's say, a person, um, one point in their life, Prepared the Keturahs. So that, that comes with the death penalty. So 
Let's pick a better example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's say a a person has a firstborn son and he's a Yisrael and all the qualifications and he refuses to redeem him. The positive commandment in the Torah. And I'm using an example which um, doesn't really affect anyone on a personal level just so that we can then um, know that that example isn't referring to us and then you can think about what does refer to you because you know that it's not this example. So someone has a firstborn son, and they just, they don't, they don't redeem them. They think, you know what, this is a mitzvah, it's not important. I have the money, I don't trust these kohanim, you know, things like that. Whatever his excuse may be for not redeeming his firstborn son. Teshuva means that you decide that you are going to do this the next opportunity you get. And you're forgiven. A real decision. It's got to be a real decision. It can't just be games. Hashem knows exactly what you're thinking. So there's no messing around. But if you really decide that that's something, or let's go with negative commandment. If let's say a person has a suit that's wool and linen, and it's their favorite suit, and they just can't bring themselves again, fill in your own real example. You just can't bring yourself to go a day without wearing this suit. As soon as you decide, obviously you can't be wearing the suit while you decide this. So, but as soon as you decide, I am never going to wear that suit again. That's teshuva, the orisa, if it's a real decision. And Yom Kippur comes, and the person is forgiven. What about confession? What about all the other parts of teshuva? He says, those might come later. But in terms of the definition of teshuva, it's abandoning the sin. However, but the positive light that you missed by not doing the positive mitzvah, it, it, it doesn't come, in, uh, come back, right? Right, that light cannot be returned, at least not with just teshuva. Okay. It's stating the obvious. If uh, true true teshuva means you're not going to do that same sin again. Why is this such a chiddush? Uh, oh, because because the chiddush is that it's only that it's just that. But you still just the decision. When Yom Kippur comes, the Yom Kippur is not teshuva. Yom Kippur is above that. Yom right. Kippur is a cleansing which happens. The positive commandment you're forgiven right away, okay. as soon as you decide. I'm gonna. I'm no longer ever gonna have firstborn children and not redeem them. As soon as you make that decision. Tell well, it's per wife. Well, it's per wife. Because, so. Uh, oh. yeah. Her wife. <laughs> no, I, I, it's kind of, uh, uh, I think, the thing is that uh, even there, uh, that even missing the um, uh, positive command, of, it involves rebellion. So it is actually a hiddush, because it means that just doing that, you're forgiving for this negative, kind of a negative transgression. Mm -hmm. Right, well, that's what we're saying. Rebel for rebellion, it's enough to just stop doing it. Stop doing it. That's it. So, and, if, uh, so if the decision's a real decision, the person really sincerely means to do it, but the next time they're faced with that temptation, they give in. So they've been forgiven as soon as they did that teshuva. Yeah, it doesn't undo. And then they do it again. Do they have to do teshuva for... The first and the well, you have to keep. Really you have to keep doing teshuva, as we'll see, in case your teshuva wasn't a real teshuva. Oh. In other words, in theory, if you would know that your decision was a real decision, you would be fine. But you know, if you end up doing it again, we might. You might have to question your own decision. But in theory, absolutely. If a person decides, I'm never going to do that again, never. And then they're walking down the street, and then the greatest suit in the world ever is there in the window and they just can't help it and so they have to wear this wool and linen suit that they they really decided then they would still be forgiven and, and that's not according to rambam rambam wants that if when you get to the situation to do the same sin again you're not right not that the simple reading of the rambam for sure rambam, there's some debate as to what the rambam holds rambam wants a confession and when you get to the same situation if you don't do it 
And then, of course, you have to say Khatatia, Vitu Shati, and then. Right, right. There, there are, okay. Certainly, right. Other opinions are going to be are going to so require a lot I, more. I want to know what is the difference between his description of of Teshuva and Rambam. So and we, he's he, he's going to explain. He's going to explain. So, see, because they're really not disagreeing to a certain extent. He's just talking about how to perform the mitzvah of teshuva, but he still agrees you need these other things. And that's what he's going to explain. So he goes on to explain that the same thing would be if someone transgresses something for which you're liable for the death penalty by the hands of heaven, or even the death penalty by the hands of Basin, teshuva is to literally... Teshuva means to return. Mm -hmm. To return means to come back. When you sin, you go away from God. And when you stop sinning, you come back. All the other stuff, he says, like the suffering, that is a deeper level. And here he's going to say it again, and it's hard for us to handle, but don't worry, it'll get a little easier. He says like this, What you've done by doing your teshuva by what you've done by doing your teshuva is you have been forgiven for your sin but your sin is still there you've been forgiven for it you haven't removed it but he says when someone comes before Hashem and takes this step to come close to Hashem Hashem wants to reward this person and help them. In the words of the Balatanya. So out of Hashem's love for the person, which is a reflection of the love that the pers person has shown for Hashem, Hashem sends this person suffering to remove the sin. Suffering is a gift from Hashem when it comes in this form. Now, we should remember that not all suffering falls on the same category. Some suffering is punishment. Some suffering is, is um, you know, to save you from something worse. There's all kinds of reasons for suffering. But when we talk about Yusurim cleansing the person, he says the person already has been forgiven for the sin as soon as they did Teshuva. But the sin is still there with them and it's still the blemish within them. And so when you do teshuva, you and Yom Kippur goes by, you merit the opportunity to have this special surgery, to have this special procedure done to you called Yusurim, whereby the blemish is removed from your soul. What role does Yom Kippur have? When you say Kriyashma Lamita, don't we ask to not be subject to Yusurim? So we're going to talk about, he's going to say that there's things which we can have as a replacement for Yusurim. Because we haven't really defined what Yusurim is. I think many people are thinking here of Rabbi Akiva level Yusurim, where you're being combed with iron combs. Um, you know, his flesh was being combed with iron combs. We're, we're going to explain that that's not what it means. I mean, the Gemara tells us that even when you um, put your hands in your pocket to and you know, to pull out a quarter and the quarter is in the other pocket, that might be suffering. You know, it, it, it means difficulties in life. We hope we want the minor ones, but, you know, we're not davening that we shouldn't have Yusurim, that Hashem shouldn't send traffic jams to make the, our day a little longer. People should thank, thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu every time they get stuck in the traffic jam and they're not late to something as a result of that. They're just getting home later because here you have suffering, which... Contra blessings, that's relatively uh, uh, mild in terms of, it's just annoyances. Annoyances, you should be thanking all the people who annoy you because they bring you suffering with very limited cost. Don't actually thank them for annoying. <laughs> Robo -call. Well, this would work, actually. Yeah. Yeah, right. What role does Zem Kipper play then? If, the, if you're forgiven due to the teshuva, it's the Yisurim that actually cleansed the Neshama. So for negative, for positive commandments, you don't need Yom Kippur. For negative commandments, Yom Kippur, you don't even need the suffering. Because Yom Kippur will wash you off. Right, so what for, does Yom Kippur play in this? For these more serious things, Teshuvah itself 
and Yom Kippur will suspend and delay the punishment until the suffering can come and, and cleanse you. So why do you need punishment to be delayed if you've already been forgiven? Well, you've been forgiven for what you've done, but you still have the um, cleansing that needs to happen. The sin is still there, and the person in the next world is still going to be called out. So Yom for... Kippur delays the Yisuri? Yom Kippur delays the Onesh, whatever that means, whatever punishment you're supposed to get, and Yisurim will save you from the um, real Onesh. We, again, all these terms have to be defined. Okay. However, there are many people uh, make this mistake, and there are many people still today who think that the real atonement of Yom Kippur or any other sin is the fasting. According to this, the fasting isn't really related to Teshuvah at all. It's just the mitzvah of Yom Kippur, although we'll give the fasting anything. The Rambam, in all of Hilchus Shuva, doesn't bring that a person should fast fasting, fast days, in order to atone for a sin. The Rambam doesn't bring it at all. The problem is, what the Gemara doesn't tell us, is that there's a verse in the book of Yoel, which... He, the Alter Rebbe quotes, which says, Shuvu adi betsom ubebechi. You should return with fasting and crying. Which means that Yoel, unlike all these other verses, actually require, or requires fasting. So the Alter Rebbe answers the question. He says, fasting is in order to remove the suffering from the generation, from the community as a whole. That's why Tainus Tzibor, such as Tainus Esther, Tzom Gedalia, all these are for communal issues. But for your personal sins, in order for you not to get your personal punishment, that you don't need to fast. The problem is that if you look in all the ancient books written six, seven hundred years ago, all of them um, give lists of fasts. Reading those is the most um, depressing experience in the process of Teshuvah. If anyone's read any of these books that describe how to properly do teshuva, they describe, based on the holy books and the holy teachings, a number of fasts that you have to do for each particular sin. And let me just say it like this, which the Alter Rebbe basically confirms. He says, if you were to follow the system described in these books, uh, don't expect to ever see food again. At least not during the day. To death. Right. I mean, you eat at night, but basically, you'll spend the rest of your life in fasting, and you still won't have covered all the things that you need to do. So he says, no, no, no. Those fast, you don't, you don't need fasting for teshuva. That's in order to be saved from suffering, you can replace your suffering with fasting. Furthermore, fasting itself is a great way to humble yourself and to connect to Hashem faster. And furthermore, maybe there's a problem that you're not doing teshuva properly, and so the fasting will do it. But the fasting itself is not teshuva. However, that's, all of that is chapter 1 in Igeris teshuva. We now move into chapter 2, and the Alter Rebbe raises it up a level. He says that all this is when we talk about kapara and mechila, meaning forgiveness. We let you go for your sins. And so if a person does all these things, they come up to Shemayim, and we don't mention what they've done, but they're still not close to Hashem. Picture, he says the Alter Rebbe, picture a person who started, uh, tried to start a coup against the king. Gathered together some soldiers and started a rebellion. And the king sends an army after him. And he immediately realizes his mistake, sends a letter to the king and apologizes. And the king says to him, you abandoned your ways, you've changed your mind, and you are a lesson to everyone else not to do this anymore. I forgive you. That doesn't mean that he's invited to the next 
state affair, that doesn't mean he's invited to the next um, ball thrown by the king. Then what does the forgiveness mean? So it just means that you won't be in the negative. That's all forgiveness does. But what you need in order to come into the positive is you have to actually do positive things. So in the days of the Beis Hamikdash, you would have a carbon ola. You would bring offerings. And that's what, what is the word for offering in the Torah? An offering should be a matana or a gift. The word is carbon. And what does carbon actually mean? Kiruv. Kiruv, to come close. Because, says the Alta, that's what you're doing. After you've sinned, after you've transgressed, so you come close. That's like the person who, after he formed the rebellion and regretted it and apologized, then sends a tribute to the king. And that tribute could, if done properly and in the right way, could bring the person back to be reconnected to Hashem on that level. So in the days when they had a Beis Amikdash, they could bring themselves close that way. What about the <coughs> verse, uh, you know, what does Hashem ask of you but to do justice? Oh, that's before you sin. But, but I mean, walk humbly. If your attitude is in coming back, remains humble, does that at all bring you close? No, because those verses are referring to what the minimum you, you're supposed to do. It's not talking about how to fix a mistake. Right. We're saying in order to, no, I mean, any mitzvah helps, but we're talking about trying to undo those sins. So technically you should need an offering, says the Alter Rebbe. That's why there is an equivalent to bringing an offering. That's why the fasting becomes such a big deal. Fasting isn't part of the teshuva process in terms of wiping away the sin. The fasting is an actual offering of your in Talmudic terms, own flesh and blood, which you are diminishing for the sake of giving tribute to Hashem. This is why in the Gemara we find there were many great rabbis in the Gemara, Tanaim and Amoraim, who when they committed even the slightest transgression, they would fast many fasts. And you'd, you'd be shocked when you would hear, um, so if you would look at the list, and again, the Alter Rebbe is going to talk you out of this, but if you would look at the list, you would see that, for example, every time you became angry, you have to fast 151 fasts for each time you've become angry. Every time you missed a tefillah, at least for the men who are obligated in tefillah three times a day, um, every time you missed a tefillah, you have to fast 61 days for each tefillah. It's incredible. Why? Because the Arizal calculated that that much is the blemish created or the distance created by each of these sins. And when you need to fast this many times in order to, so to speak, this, bring this many offerings in order to atone for it. And as the Alter Rebbe will explain, I think we're out of time, so we'll stop here. But he'll explain that we don't have the strength to do this anymore. We don't have the ability, we can't handle fasts. In those days, these people could fast, they would suffer, and they'd put up with it and function. Today, look how people are two hours before the fast is over. It's just not an option anymore. So what do we have, what can we do in order to atone? Mitzvah Shem will pick up on this next week. So I'm still stuck on the, I, I 